I was born and raised in the same home. So I spent basically all of my first 18 years in that home. The neighborhood was very, um, a very self-sufficient neighborhood. So uh, there was a school in the neighborhood. There was a couple of supermarkets, a library. I have a lot of good memories there and I uh, love it. I used to see from my balcony the, the destruction of the area and I used to see the, the bombing and the shelling and all of the... Um, I don't know how to, to explain it in words. It, it, it's just watching it and not being able to do anything. It's a, a very helpless feeling. I remember homes as like uh, a really um, small place where you can get from east to west in about like 15 minutes and you can walk the whole city in around three to four hours. So everything was just in hand. I know every corner of my city, so it, it, I feel angry that I don't really recognize it anymore. How could it be destroyed that much? It's very hard that to go back to your house and you find it in, in destroyed in a completely different shape. I don't have anything from my house, not like a teeny tiny bit of it. I don't have anything, not even a photo of it. My mom had a lot of uh, photo albums and uh, I remember that I collected one photo from each album that means something to me and I put them in an album and I put it on the counter and we left. We, we, I didn't take anything and, and I forgot it. So when I, uh, when I heard that the house was, was destroyed, the first thing that came to my mind, that photo album, that I, I lost it. I, because I, and I, I felt like, how could I forget to take it? Because it means a lot to me. And the thing is that we don't have any photo of the house before the destruction. Any photo. Not, not even for us. So the only mem memory of the house is in our heads and our minds. Yeah. If we think about our experience of the built environment, the built environment is how we orient our understanding of the space in which we live. We think about that in terms of particular buildings for particular things and so our life becomes a kind of complicated network of rhythms and, and spaces defined by the urban environment and in that sense when the urban environment is destroyed uh, our understanding of what the city is changes, our experience of it changes and our memory of it, our memory of what it was uh, goes on uh, but, but is changed by those points of reference no longer being there. So. I think one of the first things is that for people who want to return, uh, the question about how you reconstruct that experience is always uppermost and significant. I think the second thing is that the destruction becomes invested with questions about uh, violence, uh, particularly about what has been lost. And what's lost is not just the markers of a particular spatial experience, but I think also what's lost is a sense of identity, the, the, the way in which the person that you were or the group that you were uh, and that's violently lost and so the question about uh, remembering that identity then becomes uppermost in people's minds i think i don't have memories for something before war all over my memory when when i go back and flip the pages is all about war and so i cannot recall and mention something that happened before war war is as something temporary, I, I, I understand that and I fully acknowledge that. Um, but even like war starts and ends and takes a period of time, which is short compared to my lifetime uh, up to this point. But, you know, afterwards, the, the trauma, the, the effect of war is kept in, in people's mind for a long time after that. There is no period of time where I say, we forgot about wars, we forgot about any conflict and any kind of uh, um, peaceful era, let's say. I was born in the 80s and then uh, early 90s we had the 
the Gulf War, and after that was the economic blockade, and after that the second Gulf War in 2003, and then the civil war, and then ISIS came in. So yeah, I was, I, I grew with all these kind of conflict, and that is my memory. <laughs> I mean, I grew up with that. So I can always hear people talking about stuff okay, from the 90s, from the 80s, from the civil war, from the Gulf Wars, from the ice war. So it's all over the place. Like this is, as I said, something I grew up with. I can't, I cannot say that I was very different or very frustrating back then. My 80 year old grandma, she is an 80 years old woman. And she said, uh, I, I don't want to see or like witness a peaceful era. I just want to want to hear about it. So yeah, that's something that is long before I came to this uh, life, but yeah, it's, it's still continuous and it might be there for, uh, for uh, the lifetime after me, like after I'm gone. The role of memory in conflict and in the aftermath of conflict is, is important. After a conflict, there's memories of what it was like before the conflict become particularly treasured, especially when the conflict destroys photographs. Um, any kind of material remains of that family, that individuals, that community is past. If that's destroyed by war, then all that's left is memory, right? So then memory becomes this kind of what links that person, that individual, that community to their, their past if everything else has been destroyed. So I think that's why memory becomes this fundamental issue. The thing with that, though, is that memory is flexible. It expands, it shrinks, it grows, it changes. It's not an anchor. It's not a stable anchor that always stays the same, that we can always come back to. It's constantly shifting and changing because it's partly of how we interpret our past, right? what we decide is significant or not to it. So we're constantly interpreting, reinterpreting also those very same memories. We've seen in the case of Syria, where particularly in the diaspora, there have been many efforts to preserve the memories of what certain places were like. For instance, with the preservation efforts that have, uh, and, and memory efforts, if you like, that have gone on with the Syrian community that don't just touch on buildings, but they relate these buildings to the communities that were living there, the musics, the texts, the memories. A place like Beit Beirut in Lebanon, for instance. This is a space where people can come together and talk about the war and they use the transformation of the building and they use the materiality and the transformation of this very elaborate house as a talking point to talk about those memories and how the neighborhood has changed and the vast transformation of the urban context that the war produced and the need to undo that. So this is also memory as this active process of thinking about how, you know, highlighting the ways in which the built environment was transformed during the conflict, but also looking at how the built environment created divides and the need to undo those divides and so in that sense that there, there is a design process to the way in which communities come together uh, and de-escalate conflict and, and part of sustaining peace that we should be and are often not more attentive to. Walter Benjamin once said that memory is always narrated by the winners uh, of the history and in case of Warsaw it's definitely very clear that memory is always immensely political, that there's no such thing as objective memory of the city. And especially in the case of such major traumas, like complete destruction of the city and reconstruction, we can see that the conflict about memory and whose memory is more important, it never ended. So throughout the process of reconstruction, there's been a lot of discussion of how much memory to build into the new Warsaw and how much commemoration of the trauma can we include in, in the projects that are actually forward looking. And I think one of the most interesting examples uh, of, of this type of uh, combinations of, of two functions of memory and of future is the former Jewish district in Warsaw, Muranov, and the initial 
idea of the architect was to create a housing district that at the same time was monument. So this pile of rubble was used in a way as a plinth and the whole district is elevated. It stands on this plinth like a monument. And at the same time, the walls of the buildings are also made of rubble mixed with concrete. So you have the actual remnants of the old city mixed in concrete and put into the walls of the housing that uh, people are living these days. So in a way, they're living in the rubbles. When uh, Old Homes was, was opened and people were going back to see their houses, I remember there was this old, very old lady who was grabbing this stuff that doesn't mean anything to anyone, but maybe for her it was her plate, her small pot that she used to cook in. She can't use it anymore, but maybe this is the only thing that she found there. Maybe she wants it because she used to cook in it for her family. I think th these objects uh, matter to people because they remind them of um, something valuable, which was people or other memories maybe. It kind of makes you sad and angry that here was like the home of, of, of a family, of, of uh, children. They had their personal belongings and they don't have them anymore. We were, we were attached to these stuff and memories. So it's now just like um, stones. I think the question of memory is really complicated. I think there are several things there are several different strands mixed up. On the one hand, there's the question about what has been lost. Um, and I think the, it's not until the buildings are destroyed, the ways of life associated with a particular place are, 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 are destroyed. Um, it's not until then that people start to think about what has been lost. So there's the question about the identity that has been attacked and destroyed, possibly even erased, right? The kind of the kind of cultural memory associated with a particular place, the religious buildings, the libraries, the museums, the government buildings, and so on and so forth. There's also then the question about how do you memorialize the specific acts of violence? For example, how do you memorialize the people who died in particular places? In Sarajevo, for example, they created these things called Sarajevo roses where they put kind of red uh, resin into the shell marks on the streets in order to kind of show where people had died um, symbolically to kind of recreate the idea of kind of blood on the pavement uh, and these were these kind of Sarajevo roses as they were called were kind of an attempt to kind of memorialize the specific acts of violence within the war uh, and to kind of keep people focused on the fact that it wasn't you know that people had still died even if we rebuilt all of the kind of architecture prior to the war, even if families came home and so on, people had still died in these places. I think one of the issues in post-war situations that is that increasingly there's this expectation that the memorials will be built and that memorials are somehow about rep repairing the destruction, repairing the damage, the harm that has been done during the conflict. In the aftermath of a civil war, when one party wins the civil war, wins the war, they're the ones that have all the power to rewrite the story. So if you think of sites of memory, memorial sites of various conflicts, be that the anniversaries of the bombing of Guernica, or if you think of Srebrenica, those anniversaries, those sites of memories, those moments of memory are used by political leaders. And the thing is, memorials can be just about perpetuating the conflict, reminding everyone how much one group suffered at the hands of another group. They're not necessarily about repairing or about reconciling a community. And yet we expect them to be about that, or the rhetoric is that they do that. And the problem is that now there's that expectation of building memorials. For whom? For who are these memorials? Are they for an international community that wants to feel that things are getting better and that a memorial is a sign that things are moving on, getting better, that the past is past and we can begin to concentrate on development and looking forward? Or are they really for the community that was affected by it? 
And I've mixed a little bit memory and memorials here because memorials are meant to capture memory, but they never do because memory is constantly changing and interpretations change. And the way memory is used changes based on the context in which it's being used. I think from my experience of engaging with communities that have experienced enormous acts of violence in erasure, there is a tension between those that really do want to not remember the horrible times of the war and those that are trying to, to keep the memories alive of, of before the war or during the war. And getting that, that balance right is, I think, a process of constant negotiation and dialogue and one that there is no right answer to. There is no right amount of memory or preservation to be able to move forward. It needs to be a very grounded engagement with that context, learning from that past and, and not only learning from it in a way that there are stories to tell um, about what happened in the past and how they can be avoided in the future, but in a, in a design sense and in a built environment sense, to really engage with that history in a way that is looking at how those processes are still present in the fabric and need to be undone for a community to be moved forward and forward meaning to one in which there is greater communication and participation rather than exclusion and non-communication. The war and destruction and the trauma of the past is really very, very present in in the urban space and the urban identity of Warsaw. And there's particularly one moment, a ritual that um, that is very strong and often surprising for people who visit the city. Namely, on each year on 1st of August, which is the anniversary of the beginning of the Warsaw Uprising at 5 p.m., which is called the, the zero hour of the uprising, the whole city freezes. So the sirens go off at 5 p.m. People who are walking on the street all of a sudden stop and just stand in silence. The, the, the cars on the street stop and start honking. And for one minute, really nothing is happening. Like a Warsaw becomes a, a still frame, like a frozen picture from the movie. And this, this moment in a powerful way remembers and reminds us that the fact that Warsaw exists is actually a miracle, that it is a city that was killed in this target process of, of herbicide. And as, as much as this moment is really very touching and very beautiful for the citizen of Warsaw, the unity that comes from this moment is, of course, immediately destroyed after this minute ends. Um, and the city divides into, into fractions who interpret this destruction and reconstruction in a very different way. So this memory, of course, always has this double meaning. It's something that can unite people and something that can divide people. And I think... In terms of war, so this question how to remember the past should be also asked together with the question how to forget the past. And in this sense, it's very hard in Warsaw to forget about, uh, about the war trauma. And it's sometimes also unproductive. I mean, sometimes there's not enough effort to, to move to the future, to, to orient yourself towards life.